Hey guys, welcome back to the Shipmate YouTube channel. This week we're talking all about Fred Smith and FedEx. It's part four of our History of Mail series. So one of my favorite stories of all time is the founding of FedEx, or should we call it FredX? So Fred Smith was at Yale after he got out of the military, and he had this great idea. And he thought about what if we could combine ground and air transport to be more efficient than just sending packages on commercial flights. And if we could create an integrated ground and air network, we could increase the speed at which we ship things. And he really loved this idea, and he decided that he was going to write about it for an economics term paper. So Fred Smith flushes the whole idea out, writes on how, you know, you could use your own trucks to transport it to your own planes, and then fly it to a city and unload it with your own trucks and deliver it to somebody's door. And the professor hates it, right? The professor gives him a terrible grade. I think it was a C in, uh, you know, the, the rumors I've heard. And Fred Smith gets this idea that I'm going to do this no matter what. It's a good idea. The professor's wrong. I'm going to do it. So when Fred Smith graduates from Yale, he uh, takes his inheritance and combines that with some investor money. And he sets up Federal Express, which is FedEx. And he decides that he is going to test his idea. He is going to see how fast he can ship a package across the United States. So he starts setting up in Arkansas, and that's just not working out. So in 1973, he moves his company from Little Rock, Arkansas, to Memphis, Tennessee, where it is today, and he buys a bunch of jets, and he decides that he's going to start testing his idea. On his first day of operation, he manages to use 389 employees and seven jets to ship a measly 189 packages to over 25 U.S. states. Although many would consider this a failure, this marks success because it proved that the model worked, that you could pick up packages and deliver them quicker by using an integrated air and ground network. So over the 70s, Fred would continue to grow Federal Express despite it losing money. And in 1977, after twisting some arms in Congress, FedEx goes out and buys a bunch of Boeing 727 aircraft. And these aircrafts could hold almost seven times as much as his previous jets. So after he's able to use these larger jets to deliver cargo, his output increases immensely. Around this time, FedEx becomes a publicly traded company. In 1978, FedEx appears on the New York Stock Exchange and is publicly traded. So anybody in America could buy stock in Fred's company. In 1981, FedEx builds its super hub right next to the Memphis airport. And this is where they would be doing the bulk of their US operations. So they built this big massive building. And by 1983, FedEx is the first US company to reach a billion dollars in revenue without any kind of mergers or acquisitions. This is a huge achievement and it really shows the massive scale of the company even back in the 80s. In 1984, FedEx acquires Gelco International Carriers and they are now able to ship to over 84 countries worldwide. By acquiring this company, they are now able to service most of the world and their fleet of planes gets even larger. FedEx's business model is now paying off as they are the world's largest express provider. In 1985, they opened their new hub in Brussels and this would be the hub that they operate out of and serve Europe and the rest of the world. In 1994, it becomes official. Federal Express becomes FedEx and they trademark the name and begin to use it and FedEx enters the modern day language as it becomes one of the most noticeable brand names in the world. In 1997, FedEx pulls off a huge stunt. 
they create an around-the-world flight to prove just how fast their jet planes can get around the world and deliver packages. And this is something that a lot of companies at the time were not doing because, you know, around the world flights have already been done. But FedEx really wanted to show the capabilities of its planes and the advancement in the technology since, you know, the early 1900s where people were pulling stunts like this. So FedEx made this big deal out of it, but it really showed just how far the logistics company had come and just how great its capabilities for delivering packages around the world were. In 2000, FedEx renames itself yet again to the FedEx Corporation to show the wider array of services that they offer, right? So, you know, FedEx is not just an express service. They have express services, ground services, global services, they have auxiliary services. So they really wanted to capture all that in the name and that's the reason for the rename and the rebrand. In 2009, FedEx introduces International Economy Service. And this is really good because 2009, you start to see the emergence of e-commerce as we know it today, right? Like early days of Amazon, early days of eBay. Uh, you know, these companies really start coming into their own near the late 2000s. And to meet this demand, a lot of online sellers need an affordable option to ship internationally. And up until this time, FedEx was only selling these quick uh, very pricey delivery options for international trade. But with the introduction of FedEx International Economy, business owners were now able to send international parcels at an affordable rate. And this was great for e-commerce and the whole e-commerce boom. Today, FedEx is really focusing on its commitment to the environment. They're trying all kinds of electric vehicles, sustainability at their facilities and this has been a really big focus of FedEx as well as expanding its ground and air networks to become even more efficient. So guys I hope you learned something new about FedEx that you haven't heard before. I hope that you guys liked the video enough to give us a like, give us a subscribe, give us a share. We're trying to hit 3,000 and we're just right there and we need your help to get there. So thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next week for the last part of our History of Mail series.